Hello, I'm Tom Wilkinson, and welcome to the Thinking in English podcast, a podcast for intermediate to advanced level English learners. Does your English accent matter? Does British English really exist? How can you become more confident in your English speaking skills? On today's episode, Dan Sensei joins us to discuss some of these questions give you all some great advice and motivation, and model a native British English conversation. You can find the whole transcript for free on the Thinking in English blog. Have a look at my Instagram page, Thinking in English podcast, for some more great content. Um, The vocabulary list for this episode will be on the blog and also at the end of the episode, so make sure you don't miss it. And... Let's just get straight into today's conversation. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm pretty excited about it. How are you doing? Uh, I, I'm okay, thank you. I, I was actually vaccinated against COVID-19 for the third or technically fourth time this, uh, <laughs> yesterday. So I had a, a bit of a headache, but I'm feeling much better now. Mm, um, that's good. Can you give us a short introduction to who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Dan. Um, Some people might have seen me online as Dan Sensei or whatever. Um, I'm an English teacher. Uh, I've been teaching English in Japan for the last six years, I think, about six years. And before that, I taught in England a little as well. Um, Yes, I teach all ages all levels from little kids right through to old grandmas Uh, it's a very fun experience other than that I'm from Sheffield in England I'm married to my Brazilian wife and I've got two cats called Melonkun and Panchan so yes that's me why why did you become an English teacher or maybe how did you become an English teacher that's a good question um So, yes, I studied sound engineering at university um, about the same time that people started building home studios very cheaply. So (laughs) by the time I'd finished university, most of the jobs had just disappeared. Um, Then I worked in IT for a while and I got bored of sitting at a computer all day, decided to go back to university and get some qualifications for teaching English. I did a CELTA and some other bits and bobs and then decided I like talking to people I like meeting new people I like helping people learn a skill or uh, better themselves in some way so I decided to take the jump and become an English teacher searching for jobs online because England doesn't particularly need English teachers and one of the first ones that came up was a job in Japan. I applied and got it. So I came here. I think a very similar story <laughs> to me. Um, so did you speak Japanese when you first arrived here? Very, very little. I, okay, I could same, ask same where here. the station is, but I couldn't understand the answer. Oh, that's so. better than that was better than me. <laughs> better than me. I, I came with I came with nothing. So um, and if you want to hear more of my language learning story, I'll be recording an episode on Dan's podcast as well. So I'll make sure to link that everywhere. Um, what are some of the challenges of teaching English in Japan? I think that I notice with a lot of students, especially younger students, they are terrified of making a mistake, especially yes. in a group. Um, so if they can't say something perfectly, they kind of don't say anything. So building the confidence enough that they realize it's okay to make a mistake and it's not the end of the world if that happens is hard work at first. But once you build that rapport with somebody and once you've kind of got them to come out of their shell a little, um, it's much easier. Um, That's a big challenge. Other challenges are basically the differences between the language. You know, things like articles that don't exist in Japanese are really difficult for them to to use, you know, like we use them. So, Yes, definitely. The, ah, an, uh, I can't explain them. Almost impossible to explain because... (laughs) It's something you learn innately as a child and you learn the right context as an English, as a native English speaker. 
for for learners although the, the rule exists it's so hard to apply in natural conversation it, it, there's so many like avenues that you have and things you have to think about when you're deciding which one to use uh, i once tried to make a flow chart to show like the decision making process it just took so long like all the different variables were too hard yeah and i think the confidence um and not making a mistake point that you made is really important Uh, earlier this week i was taking a a public speaking japanese public speaking class um, uh, at the university i i I research at and after the class a lot of people came up to me and said wow your your japanese is so good i said it's not you heard me speak and i made more mistakes than everyone else in this class probably combined i'm really not perfect when i speak but I, ha- I just don't care anymore. Yeah, I have, exactly. I, I lived in the countryside where no one spoke English and I had to just speak Japanese for two years and I lost all of my inhibitions, mm. all of my fear of speaking in English or speaking in Japanese, sorry. The only thing I had to do was speak. And if mm. I didn't speak, I wouldn't survive, right? <laughs> so, exactly. Okay, so let's move on to the real reason I invited you onto the podcast today, sure. as, as much as I was interested in, in who you are. <laughs> we both come from the UK. Mm. And there's this concept in English learning of British English. And I get a lot of messages and, and requests of people saying, oh, I really want to learn your accent. I really want to learn the British English accent. But Dan, you also speak British English. That's right. But the, the guys listening at home probably realize that we speak very differently. For sure. It's such a big thing that when people say British English, what do they mean? Do they mean like what you hear on BBC radio? Do they mean like people from Newcastle, people from Liverpool, people from, you know, anyway, it's totally different no matter where you go that what, do you mean when you say British English? Within the UK, you can travel 10 kilometers between different villages and your your accent completely changes to to almost a different language, right? For sure, for sure. So uh, you mentioned earlier, you come from Sheffield in the Mm, UK. Can you give everyone, if they don't know where Sheffield (laughs) is, can you sort of explain whereabouts in the UK it is? If you take from, you know, the, the top of Scotland to the bottom of England, it's almost exactly the center uh, of that. And it's in Yorkshire. So it's near Leeds and Doncaster and places like that. Um, usually in Japan, nobody's heard of it. So I say, oh, it's like an hour from Manchester is the, the right. best I can usually give most okay. people. Um, but yes, that's basically where it is. It's an industrial city famous for steel. And that's about it, to be honest. There's not uh, much got, going on. They've got some successful football teams. Uh, once upon a time. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> once upon a time, I guess. Um, you still have a tinge of Sheffield accent, but, <laughs> but how has your accent changed over the last, I guess, six or seven years you've not been in the UK? Oh, my God, completely. Um, when I first came to Japan, I still had a very strong Yorkshire accent. And I knew I was in trouble when the teachers from Australia couldn't understand what I was saying. Like if the other teachers can't understand what I'm saying, the students have got no chance. So slowly it's morphed into this weird mix of like kind of some Americanisms because it's so common to hear American English here. Some more clear pronunciation of words if anybody's ever heard yorkshire dialect you'll know like the letter h doesn't exist the word the disappears and forcing myself to really almost over pronounce these things so that people can understand what i'm saying has become kind of normal now because that's day in day out the only time i really sound like i'm from yorkshire is if i talk to my brother on the phone (laughs) <laughs> and right. then instantly it kind of clicks back but if i'm talking to people whether it's you know students or my wife or when we're when i'm doing anything teaching based online so your instagram or whatever it's kind of this teacher voice which is d- 
designed to be easier to understood, designed to be easier to understand, I should say. Um, but little parts still come through. Do, do you think the your Yorkshire accent has maybe affected your life or affected your I guess your <laughs> your career your 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 profession because a lot yeah. of people are really really worried about their accent when they're learning English um, so how has your accent affected you in the UK people when you have a Yorkshire accent people think of you as being kind of old-fashioned and you know you're not <laughs> you don't like modern things and it's kind of a stereotype of Yorkshire people, right? We very kind of manual labor, working class kind of area. And this becomes like kind of a, a badge of pride as well. Like that's where I'm from. That's who I am. And I quite enjoy the Yorkshire accent. I think it's kind of fun. It's, it's interesting. And I like that it's kind of unique in its own way. I think that's really important. Mm. I tell that to people all the time who are really worried about their accent. I, I tell them, don't lose your Japanese accent or your Korean accent or your Italian accent because it's it's you. That's your exactly. unique identity. And if you lose that, you just become generic in another language. Exactly. You, you lose that that part of you which connects you to your original culture and your original um, your original upbringing. Yes, yes, yes. Like sounding a little bit Japanese or Korean or Italian or whatever when you're speaking English is not a problem. Not at all. Not at all. Like unless you suddenly decide you want to become a, you know, a BBC newsreader or something, but you don't need this perfect accent. We don't all want to sound like Harry Potter, you know, like that. <laughs> I get that all the time. Oh, I love Harry Potter. I want to sound like that. Why? Why do you want to sound like that? Sound like you because that's who you are. And if I can understand you, that's all that matters. It, it doesn't matter otherwise at all. Yeah, most European countries changed their teaching styles probably about 20 or so years ago to move away from teaching accent and pronunciation mm. perfectly and instead spending that time teaching vocabulary and grammar because that is so much more important. The ability to be uh, understood and comprehended mm relies more on your grammar and vocabulary than it does on your pronunciation. As long as your pronunciation is clear, I think, I think it's generally, generally accent doesn't matter. I agree completely. Like being understood is the goal. Having some picture perfect accent of whatever you think British English is, is fine if that's what you want to dedicate your life to, but it's not important. I'm going to understand you either way so it doesn't really matter it doesn't matter at all do you think british english actually exists no what people think is british english is maybe a hollywood version of english or bbc english or rp or whatever you want to call it sure there is that idea but we don't all sound like the queen you know nobody really speaks like that and like you said you can go 10 kilometers in any direction and you're going to encounter different sounds different words different dialects so when you say british english what do you mean because it doesn't exist as just one thing even in yorkshire different towns have different words and different sounds and different dialects and we are 10 minutes apart if there's that many dialects and that many different sounds being made in england how can you say that that one is british english it doesn't exist right so i half agree with you hmm. right i british english i guess does exist written oh yes okay right in, in a written form hmm. we do spell words slightly differently to american english we do have slightly different uh, grammar rules as well hmm. and you know i'm sure that if myself and dan were to write something we'd probably follow the same rules but if we're having a conversation we're not following exactly the same rules of speaking um, in terms of accent and in terms of vocabulary hmm. 
So there are lots of slang terms in the UK, and I want to show, share with you some Sheffield slang terms. <laughs> so um, I'm going to sort of say the word to Dan, and I want to see whether or not he can explain what these words mean. Okay. okay, so Sounds I found great. I found these all on an article online. So <laughs> hopefully they are really Sheffield slang. Okay, and I've not been tricked. Um, <laughs> okay, so the first word is nout. Ah, nout. okay. So where I'm from, it's pronounced more like note. Note. Um, okay. but it basically means nothing. Um, it's like what What are you doing tomorrow? Ah, no. Right, I'm not doing anything. Yeah, so nothing. So it's a contraction of of nothing, I guess. No, I think uh, what happens in in Yorkshire, oat becomes anything. So anything we say oat. So if you put not oat, you get notes. Okay. Yeah, like that. Um, so like, I'm gonna shop. Do you want oat? Nah, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so you can you can already see there is some big vocabulary <laughs> differences here. Um, okay, the next word. This is one I've never heard before. Um, chuddy. Chuddy, yes, chewing gum. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure where this one comes from, but when we were in school, uh, you'd often say to your friends, like, oh, have you got a chuddy? Like, have you got a piece of chewing gum? So, so this is actually quite a common one. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, because I'd never heard of it before. So um, I'm surprised by that. Um, it's one okay. of those ones that I didn't realize was a Yorkshire thing until I talked to people from outside Yorkshire. Growing up, that was so normal that I just thought that's what people called it. Yeah, there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of this uh, mm. in, in, in British English, especially when you grow up in, in one place. Mm. Uh, as soon as you leave, you know, I moved from Milton Keynes to Nottingham mm. um, and from, from university and... Mm. Yeah, they speak differently in Nottingham. <laughs> and I was surrounded by people from different parts of the country who all use different words. Um, one of the uh, things people describe differently are bread cakes. <laughs> now, what is a bread cake? Because this is another one I don't know about. <laughs> yes. So this word is quite controversial, right? If you go to Yorkshire and you want to start an argument with a group of Yorkshire people, show them a picture of this and be like, what's this called? You're going to get 10 answers in an argument. Um, but a bread cake is basically a small bread roll. Yes, uh, I would call it a, a roll. Yeah, I a would roll. call it a roll. Uh, but we call it a bread cake, which is stupid because it's not a cake. But um, it is bread. Yeah, at least 50%, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, we grew up, called it a bread cake. Uh, it's also called a cob. Yeah, in some places a cob, a, a bap, a roll. Oh, yeah. I've had a bun before. A, a balm cake, a balmy as well. I've yep. heard. Um, I don't know why we've got so many words for this one thing, but yeah, uh, bread roll is the way I would describe that. Yeah, so it's the kind of thing you'd put a, a burger inside. Yes, right? yes. A up. Ah, hello. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a up. It just means it's like a casual greeting. Um, this feels a little more old-fashioned Yorkshire. I often say all right, which is kind of you all right. Are you all right? You're right. Right. So uh, I will I will say all right. Mm. Right. I won't use the you part, but when I greet people, yeah, greet right. my friends, I'll say all right. Mm, same, but it, in, in Yorkshire it becomes all right for some reason. So you're right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay. How about sound? Oh, okay, so this means that something is like you could say that a person is sound, it means they're like a nice person, they're easy to get on with. Um, it also kind of means like, okay, I understand. For example, your friend says, okay, we're going to meet at the pub at eight o'clock. Oh, okay, sound. Like, I got it. I understand. It's fine. So, yeah, that's a quite a common one as well. Okay, and the final word on my list, general. Ah, yeah, this is a, one of those that people argue about. Um, but general is basically a, a, a walking space between two houses. Yeah, kind of an like alleyway. A, I yeah, guess. like an alley, like a, some people call it a snicket. Um, but yes, a general, it's like between two houses, a place that you can walk. Can you tell us a bit about your language learning journey? Mm, so obviously living in Japan, I learned Japanese. I say learned, still learning. Even though I'm an English teacher, I'm not 
the best language student you're gonna find same i i'm not great at learning languages i find it quite difficult because i think because i've broken down english to such a kind of understand everything because i'm trying to teach it to people that when i don't understand everything in another language it's kind of hard for me to put it together in my head but when i came here i spoke very very little and a few experiences later like two and a half hours trying to open a bank account where it resulted in the woman telling me that my passport was wrong i realized like wow um i gotta learn some japanese pretty quick um so what i would do is i'd learn a new phrase or some new words or something something conversational and i'd go to the standing bar near my house and i would say that expression to everyone right and i would just see what they said and i would kind of memorize what they said so then i learned how to respond if somebody else said it to me and basically built up a conversational kind of database that i could call upon yeah i guess there is definitely some similarities between us because i also came to japan with very little um very little japanese both written and spoken so it was all a process of learning as fast as I can and, and learning what is most necessary first, I guess. Yes. Um, but something I've been doing recently is, is also going to the local sort of standing par mm. and practicing because, mm. because of COVID for the first few months I lived in, lived in Tokyo, I couldn't really meet many people because a lot of places were closed all, all the time or they closed at 8 PM. Mm. Um, so in the last few months, as things have got slightly better here, I've been spending more time at my local coffee shop, which also turns into a bar at night, and just speaking to people. Um, and I think it's a, just a really nice thing to do, and it gives you an opportunity to practice. So I definitely encourage anyone listening who has the opportunity to go somewhere. Maybe there's, uh, maybe you live in an English speaking country and you can go to a, a often a small intimate bar or pub yes. is a is the best place to go to because if you go to a bigger place you have your own table and you're mm. not near anyone that's right it's, the place i go to is only two chairs mm. um, and everyone else has to stand around so that's, right. that's why i like it yes a same experience like uh intimate you're kind of you can't help but make eye contact with people and then you've got a, an open door and to anyone listening like we both mentioned we make a lot of mistakes, uh, but we don't care. And I think having that opportunity to feel free to express yourself in a language that you're learning and not worry too much about, oh, is this the correct, you know, conjugation of this word or whatever. As long as the other person is kind of nodding and smiling, you're going to build your confidence and that's going to lead to you being more outgoing and trying new situations. And you're going to naturally spend more time in the language which means you're going to learn more of that language just by doing it. Yeah, and, and you're going to make mistakes, uh, but it's a good story <laughs> when, yes. you, when you look back on it. I, I've, I've made a lot. Um, I accidentally became a Santa Claus for a kindergarten uh, <laughs> because I didn't, know, I didn't understand the question I was being asked. Um, I've had some terrible haircuts here. It's part of the journey. Yes. And if you can take it all in, I guess, take it all in good humor. Mm. Um, you know, have you ever had any... I guess not not embarrassing but uh, or maybe embarrassing sort of incidents with your Japanese learning yeah uh, well the the one big experience that um made me learn uh, <laughs> made me learn Japanese as uh a trip to the doctor a camera was introduced to me in a way <laughs> that I was not prepared for uh. Uh, and I would have been prepared for had I understood what they were saying. Ah, so you were doing, uh, you were doing the old nod and say yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. And then <laughs> next thing, lie on the bed. I'm like, okay. And then, and then I knew I was in trouble. And so, yeah, that was a, a funny thing that I think about now that really kickstarted like, okay, this is serious. Let's, let's buy a textbook. Let, let's learn some words. Right, uh, right. And it's, it, but it is often these experiences that, you learn most from but you you're also learning another language mm -hmm. right 
so recently I started learning Portuguese uh, because like I mentioned earlier, my wife's from Brazil, even though we met in Japan and most of our communication is in English. Uh, I recently started trying to learn Portuguese. Uh, and I say recently, I mean, you know, two months ago, maximum. So it's, it's interesting because being uh, an English speaker, a lot of like the European languages, there's a lot of similarity in sounds and words that even if you don't know the word, maybe it sounds enough like the English word, you can guess what it means. Um, so that's kind of interesting. There's some stuff that just blows my mind because I've never really tried to learn European languages before. You know, like the, the masculine and feminine nouns and the amount of different articles and stuff they've got is kind of mind blowing. But at the moment, I'm just trying to acquire vocabulary, like get the core of 2,000, 3,000 words and then take it from there. So do you have a, I guess, a language learning plan or are you kind of free studying i guess is that, is that the right term free studying um because <laughs> when i first started learning japanese i very much had some textbooks that i would use every day right i'd finish work and i'd study japanese and i studied every day pretty much for two years basically mm -hmm. and i managed to go from nothing to passing the i guess the third level of the japanese mm -hmm. language proficiency test scheme and i was probably a lot better than that actually mm -hmm. um but for the last four years, I've had no plan in my mm. language studying. And I have just been studying occasionally without really any focus. And my Japanese has got much worse. <laughs> um, it's just declined cons consistently, mm. especially now I live in, even though I'm in Japan, I live in basically an English environment as I research mm. and study primarily in English. So it's, yeah. Have you got a plan or are you um, just free studying like I am? <laughs> So, yeah, the, the Japanese thing, um, at first I learned like survival Japanese, like what do I need to survive? Because it became more about not the language, like I got to survive. And so I did the same as you probably, we studied the same textbooks, everybody studies, you know, the same textbooks. And probably my, my level is, a, is N3, push, between N3 and N2. Um, but also like you, the pandemic, has stopped me from interacting with people outside my I work in English teaching so I'm English all the time and I speak with my wife in English so my Japanese also over the last two years has declined um, but in terms of Portuguese I decided to kind of approach it as a, a language learner would you know learn the core vocabulary first then pick up the grammar and then start to input as much as you can and then deal with output later and i'm not sure it's any better to be honest then i think definitely when you become proficient in a language you get to you know intermediate upper intermediate level the the need for textbooks and stuff disappears pretty quick at that point you transition to you know native media and being part of the language rather than actively trying to learn it so very much like you said in Japanese, like you studied very hard for a couple of years, got to a certain level, then, okay, now I'm just going to take it as it comes. Right. I think that's very, very, I think that's a great way to, to deal with it. Like you need the building blocks, right? And once you've got the building blocks then you build the house, however you want. Yeah. And, and my podcast, right. Thinking in English is kind of designed to, to plug the gap between mm. the textbook and the native media, mm. um, especially for really advanced articles and advanced topics. You know, there's a big gap between an English textbook written by an English teacher mm. and, I don't know, and a Financial Times article, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. But a lot of people don't care about the English textbook. They want to read the Financial Times article sure. or the sure. Economist article or the Guardian article, right? Mm. Um, but getting to that level... There's no textbook to take you there no. because most English teachers know grammar and they know vocabulary, but they can't explain the complicated theories of world politics or sociology or mm. philosophy, which is what you need to be able to understand these more advanced um, media. 
And at that point as well, it becomes just as much about context and knowing the, the terminology of that situation as it does about knowing the language, right? Uh, I'm a native English teacher. You could give me a scientific article and although I could read it, I'm not necessarily going to understand it. Definitely. And that's nothing to do with English. That's to do with my knowledge of the subject matter. And that's why doing something in English that you are actually interested in is so much more powerful than learning from a textbook. You know, if you love politics or if you love travel or cooking or playing video games or whatever it is you love, if you can get to a point where you can love that in English, that's going to be the best study. That's going to be the best thing you can do to interact with the language that you're learning. Thank you so much for coming on to Thinking in English today. Um, please promote yourself. Tell people oh. where they can find you. <laughs> okay, so if you want to find out more about what I do, uh, you can go to dansenseienglish.com. Uh, there's uh, lessons and podcasts and videos and all sorts of stuff on there. Um, but other than that, you can find me pretty much everywhere if you try dan sensei uh, but yeah come and say hello i'd love to hear from you guys yeah and i'll put all the links in the description to, to your youtube and instagram and your website um, and we're also going to record an episode for for dan so you can head over and uh, see me or listen to me mm. speak about something in uh, on, <laughs> da on dan's podcast probably yes. about learning languages yes. um so yeah thank you thank you so much for having me it's been an absolute pleasure so here is today's final thought i'd like to say a really big thank you to dan for joining us on today's episode of thinking in english i think we covered a lot of different issues and hopefully reassured you all and gave you some tips to keep improving most importantly, don't worry too much about your accent. Like Dan said, and like I said, as long as we can understand you, that is all that matters. Focus on clear and understandable English, instead of trying to copy my way of speaking. Also, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are natural, important, and an excellent way to improve your English. And if you ever find the opportunity to speak in English, make sure you take that opportunity. You can find Dan on Instagram at Dan Sensei or on his website, dansenseienglish.com, or really on all platforms, YouTube, Spotify. Um, I'll put some of his links in the description of the podcast and also on the blog. Um, and yeah, please leave a like on Spotify or rating on Apple. And uh, today's vocabulary list will follow my speaking right now. So I hope you all enjoyed this episode. And if you have any tips or recommendations for future guests, please reach out and let me know. But here is today's vocabulary list. Here is today's vocabulary list. Um, I'll put the written list in on the blog. I don't think it will fit in the description of the podcast. Um, and right now, I'll just read out the definitions. But you can find example sentences and more great content if you look at the transcript linked in the description. Bits and bobs. Bits and bobs. Small things or jobs of different types. Take the jump. Take the jump. To commit yourself to a course of action which you are nervous about. Not the end of the world. Not the end of the world. Often used to mean that something bad that happens is not too serious. Innately. Innately. An innate quality or ability is one that you were born with not one you have learned. Variable. Variable. A number, amount or situation that can change. Inhibition. Inhibition. A feeling of embarrassment 
or worry that prevents you from saying or doing what you want. Americanism. Americanism. A word or expression that was first used in the US but is now used by people in other countries, especially those where English is spoken. Old fashioned. Old fashioned. Not modern, belonging to the past. As in, she has very old fashioned opinions of marriage. Badge of pride. Badge of pride. This phrase means a mark or an expression of your pride. As in, he wore his identity as a badge of pride. RP, short for received pronunciation. This is the standard way of speaking in which middle class speakers of southern British English pronounce words. As in, so many students want to study RP, but I can't speak it. Intimate, intimate, private and personal. As in, we had dinner at an intimate restaurant. Nod, nod, to move your head down and then up, especially to show approval, agreement or a greeting. As in, many people in the audience nodded in agreement. Good humoured, good humoured, friendly or in a good mood. In, despite the bad weather, we were all good humoured. Kickstart kickstart, to make something start to happen or start to develop more quickly. And terminology, terminology, special words or expressions used in relation to a particular subject or activity. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Thinking in English podcast. Please leave a rating on Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen. Um, if you're on Apple, write a review that really, really help, uh, help the podcast and help Thinking in English grow. Check out some of my other episodes. Um, you can look through the list on uh, the Thinking in English blog. There's lots of great content on the blog and also lots of great content on my Instagram page, Thinking in English podcast on the Instagram. I'm trying to hit 500 followers not 500 followers, 500 likes on Spotify and hopefully by the end of April close to 4,000 followers on Instagram. So hopefully you can help me achieve these goals. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can always uh, donate. Um, but the best way really is sharing with your friends, following on Spotify, making sure you listen to the whole episode, even to the me speaking right now. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you have an excellent day.